chapter 19, Paul is on the second missionary journey. <clears throat> He's come to one of, seven, the one of the seven wonders of the world, the temple of Diana in Ephesus, or Artemis as she's called in the Greek. And this passage tells about um, the very exciting uh, riot of the silversmiths of uh, Diana in Ephesus because uh, the gospel was a threat to their trade, the, the sale of uh, silver shrines in honor of Diana was uh, going down. Acts chapter 19 and verse 23. About that time there arose no little stir concerning the way, which is what um, the Christian faith was called at that time. It was just called the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, or Diana, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. They, they, they were profiting from the worship of Diana at the temple. You know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number, company of people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger. Not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may count for nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence. She, whom all Asia and all the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion. They rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius, and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. Paul wished to go in among the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Some of the Asiarchs also, who were friends of his, sent to him and begged him not to venture into the theatre, as we would say the amphitheatre. Now some cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand, wishing to make a defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew for about two hours, they all with one voice cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours. And uh, when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone, a meteorite that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be contradicted, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. <clears throat> if therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. And there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today, there being no cause 
that we can give to justify this commotion. And uh, when he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. Amen, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word and give us an understanding of it. Now we come to... You may recall that I suggested to you last week that the great cities of the Roman Empire that are reached by the gospel in the book of Acts were very distinctive cities and each needed a very special approach and in different cities the message of Jesus Christ was preached in a different way. For example, the city of Athens was a citadel of wisdom and learning and culture. It was the great university city of uh, that age. And so it was natural that when Paul went there with the message of Christ, he preached the gospel in what we would call a cultured way. And he made an appeal to the people's hearts by quoting Greek poets and Greek plays and the natural revelation of God to all men. That was in Athens. But when he went to Corinth, he preached Christ in a very different way. It was the same Christ, but Corinth was a place of such wickedness and depravity that he tells us that when he went there, he didn't preach culture or quote Greek poets or Greek dramas. He went there and he was determined to know no man save Christ only and to preach him and him crucified. He preached a very direct message, a very direct challenging gospel in Corinth. Uh, the gospel preached in Athens was the same gospel preached in Corinth, but Christ was preached in these places in a different way. And it's the same sort of thing you find when you come to the great city of Ephesus here in chapter 19. Because Ephesus was a very distinctive city. And two citadels of wickedness had to be challenged and breached in the city of Ephesus. The first was the citadel of magic, black magic, represented by the seven sons of Sceva, whom we read about uh, last Lord's Day. And uh, the second citadel to be breached was the citadel of idolatry, represented by Diana of the Ephesians and her temple there, one of the seven wonders of the world. Now, the breaching of the citadel of magic is seen in the story of these seven sons of Sceva. These men were wandering Jews, and they were professional exorcists. In other words, they sold their necromancy and their black magic for money, rather like uh, mediums and people who run seances in our own uh, generation. And uh, these magicians were very impressed when they watched Paul preaching and saw the wonderful works done by him. And they decided also that they would like to have a go in the name of Jesus. And they thought that if you pronounce this magic name of Jesus, wonderful things would happen. And so they started to use the name of Jesus like a lucky charm or a talisman or like the little Christophers that you see people uh, tying up inside their cars. Now, of course, they may not be serious when they tie up a medallion of uh, St. Christopher in the car. St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers. But there is a deep-rooted <coughs> suspicion in the hearts of many pagan people today that if you tie up a medallion of St. Christopher in your car, then you won't have a crash. It's a superstition. It's a lucky charm. It's uh, the same sort of thing that you find... <coughs> in ladies who tie crucifixes round their necks. Uh, that may now be an ornament for a lady to tie a crucifix round her neck, 
But originally, it was not meant to be ornamental. It was a lucky charm. And it was designed to keep away evil spirits. And that's why people wore crucifixes. Just as originally, people wore bracelets uh, on their wrists to keep away evil from their hands. And they wore anklets on their ankles to keep away evil spirits from their feet. And they wore things in their noses to stop demons getting up their noses and causing a great deal of trouble. You see, all of that had its origins in black magic and superstition. It was a way of coping with the world of evil and with the world of demonic. Now, of course, we Christians know that there are other ways of coping with the world <coughs> of evil and particularly with the world of the demonic. But here were these black magicians in Ephesus and they thought that if you pronounced the name of Jesus, it was a kind of lucky charm and it made everything all right. And so the demon says to them, these men, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? They did not recognize the authority in these black magicians. And that is a question that the world is always asking those who profess in Christ. Because the world of evil, and particularly the world of the demonic, acknowledges Jesus Christ, and it acknowledges the power of Jesus Christ, and it acknowledges the power behind Jesus men and Jesus women. The world of evil and the world of the demonic fears Jesus Christ and Jesus men and women. It knows Jesus and it recognizes real power and real authority. And it doesn't acknowledge anything else. Jesus I know. And Paul I know. But who are you? The world of evil does not recognize the authority of those who use the name of Jesus as a kind of um, lucky charm or as a kind of uh, passport to safety. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning in this large congregation who uses the name of Jesus as a kind of lucky charm, kind of passport to heaven, without power, and without authority, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. But who are you? And so the citadel of magic was breached. The second citadel of um, evil to fall was that of the idolatrous uh, worship of uh, Diana, or as she's called in the Greek, um, Artemis. And um, it's a great lesson to Christians, you know, to see the way in which the people of Ephesus reacted to the message of the gospel. They rushed to the amphitheater and uh, they put up... Um, a fine example of um, what is called mob psychology. Uh, a great cause was at stake. The great name of the goddess was being uh, dishonored. And so you had this extraordinary demonstration of uh, frenzy and uh, hysteria. And you got this irrational chanting of uh, great is Diana of the Ephesians. It's, uh, it sounds very wonderful in the original Greek as they would have chanted it. Megale, he Artemis Ephesion. It got a beat to it, you see. That went on for two hours. Megale, he Artemis Ephesion. Megale, he Artemis Ephesion for two hours. 
You see, when men turn from God, they never turn to a vacuum. They never turn away from God to zero. They never turn away from God and Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel. They never turn from that to nothingness. I think it was uh, G.K. Chesterton who said that when men stop believing in God, they do not believe in nothing. They believe in anything. And it's true to say that if you turn from God, almost anything can happen to you. There are those in our own age who have turned from God and they have replaced God with um, the whole world of uh, uh, immorality. They've uh, started living for what is uh, euphemistically called the good life for parties and, and fun and uh, drinking and sleeping around and evenings out and the next big social event in the calendar. There are people who turn from God to the world, perhaps the more respectable world, of idolatry. And so you find people who uh, brush God out of life and they substitute for God the worship of their car, they worship their house, they worship the family, they worship promotion, and above all nowadays, they worship success. That's the great thing, is to be successful. You see, you never turn from God to nothing. When men stop believing in God, Chesterton, they do not believe in nothing. They believe in anything. And what you see in Ephesus was a flight from God into the absurd and the irrational. And that's what was going on in the amphitheater at Ephesus. Great as Diana of the Ephesians for two hours. They were running away from the challenge of Christ and the true and, true and living God. They were running away from that and they were hiding themselves in the irrational and the absurd. This is a point that um, uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer makes in uh, many of his uh, Christian books. That what has happened in the 20th century is the 20th century man has rejected God. He has turned his back on God. And he has fled from the true and living God into the world of the absurd and the uh, ridiculous. Let me give you some illustrations of that from the 20th uh, century on a broad scale. Some of you are old enough to recall the rise of fascism in the Germany in the 1930s. Now you know, if you had been alive in Germany in 1930, you would have been very impressed with the claims of the fascist movement in Germany because it was a very impressive movement originally. You see, it rescued Germany from poverty and the disgrace of the 1920s. In 1930, the German mark was valueless. You sort of went into a, a cafe and you paid 7,000 marks for a cup of coffee. It was valueless. And the fascist movement, and Hitler in particular, put, put Germany on its feet. In um, 1932. But what was not being recognized was that fascism was an anti God movement. God was excluded. Although the leaders of the Nazi party, and I find this a rather a solemn thing, they never renounced their membership of the Christian church. Ribbentrop. Goebbels, all these people, they all died as members of the Christian church. Did you know that Hitler died a Roman Catholic? He never renounced his membership of the Roman Catholic church. Of course, they didn't go to church. Their names were still on the roll. 
It was very impressive. And behind the impressiveness of the rallies and the brown shirts and the black shirts, and you know the story, behind all that, there was a flight into the ridiculous and the absurd. For example, Hitler leaned very heavily on the theories of a man called Nietzsche. Nietzsche was, um, was uh, an atheist, and he was the first man to coin the phrase Superman. And so Hitler leaned very heavily on the theories of Nietzsche and uh, uh, d- dreamed up a kind of super race when in fact any respectable geneticist could have told them you can't breed a super race because wrong things keep coming to the surface with the next generation. It was a flight from the living God into the absurd. Here's another illustration from our century. Marxism is also a flight from the true and living God into the world of the absurd and the irrational. Have you ever wondered why it is that communist parties, although they're very small, are also very noisy? Do you know why communists are very noisy? They've got to be noisy. They have to hide the lies with the noise. Why is it that in industry... Some of those shop stewards who are extreme left in their views. Why is it that that tiny minority of men and women can carry the day in industrial disputes? Why is it that they make so much noise? They've got to make a noise to hide the lies. Why is Marxism so strident and so dominant? that it now covers a third of the world's surface. It has to be noisy to hide the lies and the fantasies and the irrationality behind the facade. I think of the 1930s, which were a terrible time in the Soviet Union, the time of the great Stalinist purges and his famous five-year plans and his famous seven-year plans, and peasants were given holidays to celebrate the triumphs of the five-year plan and so on. In fact, six million peasants had just died of starvation. But he made a noise. He made a noise. Flight from God to the irrational. And it's a flight that you find if you're interested in the world of, um, of uh, culture and theatre and so on. It's a world that you see there. Uh, the theatre of cruelty, if you know of that. The theatre of the absurd, meaningless plays whose uh, messages, whose messages that life has no meaning, there is no God Man has no meaning, life has no purpose. Cruel plays filled with gratuitous, mindless violence. All this in the West End theatres of London. The theatres of cruelty and absurdity. The flight from the living God. Or take um, some of the modern poetry. With pages and pages of nonsense syllables. You, You can tear up words and letters and put them into a drum and turn them round and then you pick, pick them out and stick them on a page and that's modern poetry. It's absolute rubbish. doesn't mean anything. But apparently it's considered great poetry. Or think of some of the avant-garde music of our generation if you've ever heard of uh, John Cage in America. With, uh, he's the high priest of what's called music concrete. Concrete music. And it sounds like that solid stuff. He's written a sonata for a piano and the pianist walks on, lifts the lid, sits for 13 and a half minutes in total silence, puts the lid down, bows and walks off and everyone applauds. Now we say, that's silly. Anybody could do that. That that doesn't make sense. That's the whole point. It doesn't make sense. 
And that's his message to you. Life doesn't make sense. There is no God. There is no morality. There is no meaning. There is no purpose. The man you see is running away from the living God. Or uh, if you read the story yesterday in the, in the paper about the lady who bought what she thought was a, a modern painting by some modern artist. In fact, it had been done by a goose. Was it a goose? Just wading its way through different colors. And she thought that this was a, a really meaningful thing. But if you go to an art gallery and look at uh, modern art with the crazy paintings, Jean, Jean Miro, uh, with all the daubs, Paul Clay, with all the daubs and the scrawls and the twists, you say, anybody could do that, a baby could do that, a child could do that, just squirting tubes of, of oil paint. Oh, that's the message. There is no God, there is no meaning, there is no purpose in life. It's all meaningless. And it's no good saying if you go to a theatre and watch one of these silly plays or read one of these silly poems or listen to some of these silly bits of music or watch these silly paintings. It's no good saying, I don't understand these. You're not meant to understand them. That's the message. There is no meaning. As um, Francis Schaeffer says, you can only understand that sort of thing as part of man's irrationality and his flight from God and from grace and from Christ and from the gospel. And to come down from these high-flown scenes to the uh, plainer level, the experiments, you know, in the drugs scene with uh, dangerous substances <clears throat> that produce thrills and uh, lift you out of the world into a world of visions and, and fantasies and flights. That too is a flight from God and grace into the world of the absurd and to come to an even more different level all the mindless violence that you see in the streets um, smashing up phone booths and uh, spraying walls with uh, graffiti. These are the confessions of faith of people who have given up God and who, having given up God, have abandoned the true anchorage of life It is the message of the Bible that you cannot run away from God. God is inescapable. He will get you. He will get you in heaven or He will get you in hell, but He will get you cannot run away from the living God. And that's what the people in Ephesus were doing. In their absurd, irrational demonstration, two hours, great as Diana of the Ephesians, it was irrational. Because they were on the run. The <coughs> second thing to notice about the riot is this. Uh, what was actually the occasion for the riot? If uh, I were to ask you, what would you say was the real cause of the quarrel with Jesus Christ in Ephesus? What would you say? Hmm? It was because they saw in this man Jesus someone who was interfering with their lives. The sales <coughs> of Diana's shrines were going down. They weren't selling to the tourists like they used to sell because people were now becoming Christians 
and they weren't buying the shrines of Diana. And it has been uh, <clears throat> well pointed out that if ever a spiritual awakening were to come in this generation, and let me say again, this is the only century since the Reformation that has not seen a spiritual revival. If ever such an awakening came, you could look to the bars and the clubs and the owners of the bingo halls and all who stand behind the licensed trade and the gambling trades. You could look to the owners of the racetrack and the manufacturers and the sellers of pornographic books and films. You could look to the tobacco empires and you would see there what you saw in the men who sold the shrines of Diana. They were afraid that Jesus was going to interfere with their lives. Now, I know that there's a great deal of respectability in the world of big business. You get firms like Players and uh, Benson and Hedges uh, sponsoring sport as if smoking cigarettes was um, a way of being sporty and healthy. You get Players and Benson and Hedges and uh, Tennants and McEwans and so on sponsoring great symphony concerts in Edinburgh and in London. And it's interesting that the two great concert halls in Edinburgh were built out of beer. The Usher Hall, Usher's Pale Ale, that's what built it. And the McEwan's Hall, the best buy, isn't it? Not a great commendation for the capital of Scotland, you know, that our two finest concert halls had to be built with beer and, I dare say, on a great deal of human misery. Become respectable. <clears throat> but if a Christian spiritual awakening came, you would soon see where the enemies of the gospel lay. Because when Jesus comes, he comes to interfere with your life. He pokes his nose in. He steps into your life. And he disturbs your morals. He may even disturb your marriage. He'll certainly interfere with your pleasures. And he'll certainly interfere with the way you spend your money and what you do with your spare time. These men didn't want Jesus because he was a threat to their lives. Now, of course, Jesus can come to us as all sorts of things. He can come to comfort and strengthen and encourage and make us strong and establish us. He can come to do all of that. But when he came to Ephesus, he came as a threat to their lives. Do you look on Jesus as a kind of threat? Is, is that why, let me be frank, is that why you carefully exclude him from your life? You don't mind religion, you like hymns, you like sermons, you like services, but you're afraid of Jesus, like the man who sold the silver shrines, because he comes as a threat. My last word is this, blessed are they who allow Jesus to interfere fear with their lives. Amen, and may God add his blessing to the preaching of his word.